So probably like the majority of you, uh, I was pretty surprised when I was diagnosed with CLL and thrown into something called watch and wait, which made absolutely no sense to me. It was pretty illogical. Uh, the doctor said to me, uh, he walked in, I had no clue there was anything wrong with me. And he said, you have the C word, but it's the best you can have. Doesn't that kill you when they say that? Uh, so, you know, nothing made sense to me that how anything with cancer could be the best. Uh, but, and then he told me that he'd see me in four months and then I'd be fine. So all of this was pretty illogical to me, having to grasp all of this at once and understand. Dr. Rogers, what activities can we do while we're in watch and wait? Uh, I'm going to go with all of them that are recommended for people. So, like, yeah, so people ask me this all the time, can I do this? Can I do that? Can I do the other thing? I'm like, yeah, do all of it. And then they're like, can I do something crazy that really nobody should be doing? I'm like, no, don't do that. Like that, you know, so I'm trying to think of like, uh, like things people shouldn't do, like uh, kind of like people ask me, can I drink beer? Because I have CLL. I like drinking beer and watching football. I'm like, me too. That's like the best. Um, and they're like, I want to drink like one beer watching football. I'm like, okay. And like, sometimes I like to drink two beers while watching football. I'm like, yeah, that's fine. Really just don't get drunk every, every day. And that's not because of the CLL. That's just general advice. So if you think of, of someone with CLL, um, people in observation do live with a higher risk of infection and um, other forms of cancer. So I do think the COVID-19 pandemic was much more limiting for people with CLL and observation than for the rest of the public. So there are a few things like that. Um, but aside from going somewhere where you can't access medical care if you're about to need treatment or like some really dangerous activities that's not recommended for anybody, I tell people to just go ahead, enjoy their lives and do whatever they want to do. So here we're saying we hate watch and wait, right? But is there anything you can do to prolong your watch and wait? Because once I know personally, once I was in it and I was told it was time to treatment, I'm like, wait, what happened to watch and wait? So is there anything we can do to prolong it and, and to keep our CLL or SLL from progressing? Um, not that I'm aware of. So there's a couple of things, right? Um, so uh, there's things like there's a study with green tea extract tablets, like high dose that can lower the white count. Um, but I don't know that there's any data that really help people live longer or really prolonged watch and wait. And it's probably like a mild treatment, right? So it's like doing a natural treatment instead of like a pharmaceutical treatment. Um, there's things that I'm sure help people in general, like you were saying you did some things to like make sure you're fit and rested and, you know, eating healthier. So those things can make people feel better and be better better with their overall health, but I don't know of anything people can do specifically to increase the amount of time before they need treatment. So what does the green tea do then? I mean, cause this is something that it's, you know, I don't know if it, there was a study as you said, and it was like an urban myth for a while. And then the study appeared, how much is it that you really, do you even know how much it is you would take and, and what would do that? Well, also, I'm just laughing because everyone asked me about this, and I actually strongly dislike the flavor of green tea. I don't have CLL, so it's not an issue, but people are like, you get in these arguments in clinic where it's like, my wife wants me to drink green tea for my CLL. I'm like, do you like it? And he's like, I hate it. It's like the worst thing I've ever had in my life. I'm like, okay. So, um, you know, I, I think some of these things too, you got to be careful because the burden of doing it is a, it can be a lot. And when people start doing supplements that really don't have a certain medical benefit, and I will point out supplements are not regulated by the FDA, so you have no idea what you're buying, you can spend a lot of money and get side effects from supplements that might not actually help you at all and likely won't. Even D, like vitamins D and K2, did those help anything about those for us? Not that I know of for CLL, vitamin D does have a variety of health benefits. If you're deficient, getting that replaced is important for like other health metrics. Um, but I don't know of anything specific that that will help the CLL. Vitamin D, you can find a good supplements for. Um, but again, these aren't regulated. So it's helpful to go on the internet and look at some of the companies that rate qualities, quality of supplements before you buy them. Jump, jumping rope, does that help? 
I mean, that's fun. <laughs> Exercise is good for people, right? But I don't, there's no data that jump rope actually helps like the CLL um, probably won't help your joint health, but will help your cardiovascular health. But I, it, you know, it doesn't do anything to impact the CLL specifically. So the green tea, um, it was an extract used in that study. Um, you'd have to drink more than one can physically drink in a day to get the same benefit if you're going to drink the tea. Um, so if someone wants to try that, I strongly recommend finding a high quality green tea supplement because it's just physically not possible to drink that much green tea in a day. So one of the things that I have learned through my 13 years of dealing with CLL, I, I finally believe my first CLL specialist. He said, I'm more worried about the comorbidities than I am the CLL. If you will actually put time and effort into taking care of those comorbidities, you'll actually make my job easier. So I have embraced that. And you know, I, I listened to the question, what are the things that we can do while we're in watch and wait? Um, I know it's gonna sound uh, pedantic, but you can exercise more, you can eat better, you can eat less, you can do all the things that you need to do to reduce your comorbidities. And truthfully, there is no upper ceiling for it. Michelle and I were talking earlier today. I'm currently training for a marathon. I, I'm relapsed in training for a marathon. So yay. Um, the question becomes, though, we're all doing all this diligent effort and watch and wait. What are you looking for to say, watch and wait's over? Now it's time to treat. Tell me about the tripwires. Yeah. So the other thing, just to put some context to so that, by the way, good for you for modifying your like other risk factors for your other health conditions, because that is something active everybody can do and watch and wait. And I would say more people with CLL to take care of my clinic die of heart attacks than die of CLL. So just please keep that in mind. Um, and they're, of course, keeping up with cancer screenings and vaccines and stuff is very important. Uh, so um, I like to think of it like this. There's a group of people where they have no symptoms, lymph nodes aren't big, blood counts look fine. And you say, absolutely, there's no reason whatsoever to treat this person. And there's no cutoff on white blood cell count where you need to do treatment. I do think if you get above four or 500, usually other reasons develop and you know that's about time. Um, but there's no cutoff like, oh no, my white count hit 50, we need treatment. That's not a thing. And yes, there is a thing with doubling, but that's only with higher white counts. So it's not like, oh, it went from like, you know, 10 to 20, I need treatment. That's that's not a, a thing. So you can actually be very flexible with the white blood cell count. Don't think of a hard number there. Um, then there's people where you're like, oh, you know what? You know, we could do treatment. You know, the blood counts are going in the wrong direction. So you can see the hemoglobin and platelets are dropping, white counts going up. Lymph nodes are getting big, but they're not actually really problematic for the person. Maybe they're having some fatigue. So there's kind of like, um, you know, a window where you could say like treatment's reasonable. And then there's like, gosh, you really should have done treatment. Now you're getting blood transfusions and you feel terrible. And by the way, even people that wait a long time and do get sick from CLL because they waited a long time will be fine with treatment eventually. It's just a lot rougher to get that started. So don't think that, you know, it's not possible to treat people that either didn't know they had CLL and were very sick when diagnosed or, you know, decided not to get um, treatment and waited longer than was probably comfortable for them. And that the span from, oh, no, we shouldn't do treatment to, oh, my gosh, we should have done this sooner. And especially for a first treatment can be over a year. Like you've got a very long window and that gives you some time to decide along with your doctor what treatment's best for you and things like that. So it's uncommon that like you hit something and you need treatment tomorrow. It's more like an ongoing discussion for a while. Uh, but the things I see that I notice sometimes are like, oh, the white count's shooting up pretty fast along with the hemoglobin and platelets kind of dropping. Or every time people come back, there's more lymph nodes and they're losing some weight. There's a lot more lymph nodes and you kind of see this trend happening. Um, and then I, I do see some people that develop a lot of fatigue that suddenly starts to interfere with their personal and professional activities. And that would be a reason to say like, boy, we should really do something before this really impairs your life more. So if I think I heard you correctly, this is not really any single test result. This is more of like a general trend of a bunch of different things that you're looking at. There's no one aha moment for you, right? Absolutely true. So is there anything else that the patients and their caregivers should be 
keeping their eyes on. I mean, obviously, to me at least, they need to be 100% candid with you and let you know what's going on. But is there anything else that you can offer? Hey, you need to keep an eye on this. So every once in a while, I have a patient who develops a significant health concern that they think is like in another area, like severe diarrhea or like chest pain, you know, and that's not addressed by going to like their cardiologist or something else. So when people develop health concerns, weird symptoms, and not like, oh, my toe is itchy one day and then it's not the next day, that's fine. That happens to everybody but something significant impact in their life, weird that maybe other doctors I thought might help them with this, can't figure it out. That is always something to check in and ask like, hey, could this be related to CLL? Because there are some weird things that happen to people with CLL. And certainly the physician caring for anyone with CLL should be able to figure out like, yes, this could be related. We need to figure it out. Or like, no, but I'm going to help you figure out like what specialist to see. So, if, you know, if anyone develops weird health concerns that are, you know, really symptomatic or problematic that other doctors can't figure out always a good chance uh, that it, you know, could be CLL related and you should check in. I keep hearing that CLL increases risks of other cancers. Is this true? And what are the top secondary cancers? Um, Yes, it is true. So CLL is a cancer of immune system cells called B lymphocytes. So it changes the way the immune system works because the CLL cells are there. By the way, treatment to reduce the CLL cells doesn't fix this, only makes the problem worse. Um, So your immune system is what protects you from other cancers by killing abnormal cells that your body forms as it makes new cells over time. Um, So cancer screening is important. The top ones we see are actually skin cancers. Um, So skin cancers, I mean, and of course, uh, lymphomas, as was pointed out earlier, do occur in people with CLL, but those are kind of related types of cancers. Um, But skin cancer is actually uh, one of the top ones. So I try to get everyone skin cancer screening. And how often do you suggest patients get those? Uh, Usually annually. And then the dermatologist will tell them if they need to come back sooner based on having prior skin cancers. Catherine, didn't you just have to have something removed? I did for the third time. But this one was benign. But I have had squamous cell taken off. I've had other um, early squamous cells taken off. I get screened every six months since I was diagnosed. So while we've got you talking, I have a question here specifically on fatigue. And since we've got a medical expert and we've got uh, two people here who talk about fatigue all the time, I'd rather know how you dealt with fatigue. How how do you deal with the drag of having a CLL diagnosis? So that was the worst part of it for me. Honestly, um, I could deal with any of the other side effects, even when I just finished a clinical trial a year ago. So I've been undetectable MRD and in remission now for a year. Um, And I feel so much better, but that fatigue, even during treatment, everybody said, once you start treatment, the fatigue goes away, but I still had the fatigue even during treatment till I get off of the meds. Um, You know, I just try, I worked, I work out a lot. And I went to the gym every day and I tried to just keep up my routines. I'm generally an active person anyhow, so I try not to give into it. But, you know, for a time period there, I would fall asleep while I was working on the computer with my hand on the mouse and my wife would look over and say, Kathy, and then I just wake up and I'd start keep on moving again like I didn't do anything, but I didn't decide I was going to take a nap. I would just fall asleep. It's just really hard. That's like the worst of it, but it's so vague. Let's, so how important, you're a CLL specialist, Dr. Rogers, and you, you have colleagues who are CLL specialists, but how important is it to see a CLL specialist? And is, is this something you need to do right away as soon as you're diagnosed? Um, you know, uh, it's actually an individual decision. There are some reasons that you, that people actually definitely need to see a CLL specialist. Um, one is just if things aren't going well, right? So not responding to treatment, developing side effects, not being offered, you know, acceptable options from your, you know, general hematologist, oncologist, things aren't going well, always see an expert. Um, Some other good times are planning a treatment, any treatment, because usually the CL specialist will be able to have a good and hopefully more detailed discussion about treatment options or even offer participation in a clinical trial, which has a lot of advantages. 
Um, but this doesn't always have to be done at the time people are diagnosed, um, just because, you know, if you're in watch and wait and you're happy with what's going on, you know, it doesn't mean you have to run out and see a CLL specialist right away, especially if you don't live near a CLL specialist. And then uh, I guess at diagnosis, one of the main reasons to see a CLL specialist is to get questions answered and to learn about CLL, which I think benefits all people. Um, most people do want to learn more about it, but there's a couple of people that, a group of people that cope uh, by putting CLL from their mind, and they can certainly delay seeing a CLL specialist until there's a reason like needing treatment. Thank you.